On the morning of July the 1st, 1681, almost 300 years ago, the two sheriffs of London and Middlesex called at the Tower of London and demanded under warrant an Irish-born prisoner by the name of Edward Fitzharris, who was due for execution on that day. As was the custom, Fitzharris was tied, face uppermost, on a wooden sledge, drawn by a horse, and was thus conveyed to Tyburn. The procession accompanying him stopped on the way at Newgate Prison, where it was joined by another sledge carrying Oliver Plunkett, Archbishop of Armagh, also on his way to execution. On the same day, and in the same place, Fitzharris was executed. And to the last, the contrast of his manner and actions displayed in brighter light the happy lot of the primate. And whilst Dr. Plunkett excited compassion on account of the atrocious and unmerited suffering, and became universally loved for his innocence, and extolled to the skies for his constancy, Fitzharris was abhorred for his wicked deeds, despised for his vile cowardice, and uncompassioned in his suffering as being his due. Fitzharris and Plunkett did not know each other. Fitzharris, ex-soldier turned blackmailer, whose trial almost caused the downfall of the monarchy. Plunkett, the reforming archbishop, the victim of a last, desperate attempt by Shaftesbury to keep the already discredited popish plot alive. But on that morning, in purely political terms, the execution of Fitzharris was the more significant. Despite the best efforts of Shaftesbury and his country party, who had championed his cause, Fitzharris was condemned to die. So, even on the day of his execution, Oliver Plunkett was to be a political pawn. His expected pardon from the king failed to materialise. Indeed, Plunkett's presence at Tyburn with Fitzharris on that morning was the best insurance Charles II had, yet the execution of Fitzharris would proceed. Still, there was no hint of bitterness in Plunkett's final speech. You see how I am required, and how, by false oaths, I am brought by my accusers to an untimely death, which wicked act need not reflect upon the order of St. Francis or on the Roman Catholic clergy, it being well known that there was a Judas among the Twelve Apostles, and as Holy Stephen did pray for those who did stone him, so do I for those who with perjuries do spill my innocent blood, saying, as St. Stephen said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. I do heartily forgive them, and also the judges who did expose my life to evident danger. I do finally forgive all who did concur, directly or indirectly, to take away my life, and I ask forgiveness of all those whom I have ever offended by thought, word or deed. I beseech the all-powerful God that he will grant the King, Queen and all the royal family health, long life and all prosperity in this world and in the next everlasting felicity. But the King, to whom he protested his loyalty, waited until the following day before making his move. On July the 2nd, he ordered the arrest of Shaftesbury. Opposition to the king vanished. The popish plot was over. Oliver Plunkett was the last Catholic cleric to be executed at Tyburn, but even allowing for the excesses of the popish plot, it was a combination of the most unfortunate circumstances which led him to such a fate. His very appointment to the See of Armagh, twelve years previously, seemed to be a last-minute decision. Following his ordination, he had remained in Rome and was appointed as Professor of Theology in the College of Propaganda there. When the exiled Archbishop of Armagh, Edmund Riley, died, there were at least twelve other names put forward. Indeed, a nationalistic note was introduced, not for the first time, when some of the clergy from the Diocese of Armagh sent an agent to the Pope with this letter. I humbly beseech your Holiness to consider and deeply ponder the appointment to the vacant see of Armagh. On behalf of the clergy, nobles and people, we deem it to be extremely serious if any outsiders be intruded upon to fill the bishopric. It is in this light that they reckon all Meath men as aliens, in manners and language so different that they are not suitable to preach to them. Nay, more there arises wherever it may come a great enmity between them. Therefore we ask, with due submission of mind, that some person among the natives be appointed, a man who knows the character of the province. If not, 
nothing is more certain that an uproar will be feared in the church, and without doubt the apostolic see will have to support the primate abandoned by Armagh. While this letter was not directed personally against Oliver Plunkett, he fitted the bill exactly. He was, of course, a meat man, descended from one of the best-known old Norman families, and was related to the earls of Fingal, Roscommon, and the Baron of Louth. Indeed, it is quite possible that this very letter had the opposite effect. It smacked of insubordination. So Rome appointed a palesman, Oliver Plunkett, to settle the many dissensions in the province. It was to prove an unenviable task. The political situation in England was in a delicate state. It was 1670, ten years after the restoration of Charles II. The liberally minded Charles would have granted a measure of religious toleration to everyone, but the Parliament would not agree to grant this freedom either to Roman Catholic or dissenter. But this fierce anti-Catholic bias had more of an economic rather than a religious base. Many members of Parliament were living on church and abbey lands confiscated in the previous decades. They feared that a return to Roman Catholicism, or popery as they termed it, would mean that they would lose this land. This was especially true with regard to Ireland, and so debates in the House of Commons were filled with forebodings. Popery and slavery, like two sisters, go hand in hand. Sometimes one goes first, sometimes the other. My lords, give me leave to speak about our sister, Ireland. I am creditably informed that the papists have their arms restored. The sea towns, as well as the inland, are filled with them. That kingdom cannot continue long in English hands if some better care be not taken of it. So there was method in this religious madness, and the climate was not helped by the fact that Charles II, nominally at least a Protestant, had no legitimate heirs, and was due to be succeeded by his brother James, Duke of York, who was soon to declare himself a Roman Catholic. Despite this, there was a measure of religious toleration when Oliver Plunkett arrived in Ireland. The king had completed the secret treaty of Dover with his cousin Louis XIV of France, in which he promised, in exchange for a large grant of money, not to make war on France, and also that at a future date he would declare himself a Catholic. This part of the treaty, of course, was not made known to Parliament, or indeed to the majority of his ministers, and, to show his good faith to Louis, Charles had suggested in the previous year that his former emissary and chaplain to the Queen, Father Peter Talbot, be appointed as Archbishop of Dublin. Talbot's appointment, however, had also a political motivation, inasmuch as he was instrumental in causing the temporary downfall of the Viceroy in Ireland. The Viceroy was the redoubtable Duke of Ormond, and Talbot was the anonymous author of a pamphlet in which he accused Ormond of making excessive profits from his huge estates in Ireland. It was into this world of political intrigue that Oliver Plunkett stepped at the beginning of 1670. Ormond had been succeeded briefly as Viceroy by Roberts, and Plunkett was forced initially to go round disguised as an army officer, calling himself Captain Brown. However, within three months, Roberts was succeeded by the more liberal Lord Barclay, and Plunkett, availing of the change, began his pastoral work in the north, giving confirmation, calling synods, passing laws and settling disputes. An indefatigable letter-writer, this is how he himself described some of the problems which faced him during those early months. The most difficult task, however, was the removal of Terence Kelly, vicar of Derry. He had such influence with the Protestants that he made my two immediate predecessors tremble and procure the imprisonment of more than one visitator. I went in person to the Diocese of Derry, convoked the clergy, suspended his jurisdiction, and appointed in his stead Dr. Conwell, a learned and holy man. I was accused before the lay tribunal, but the unfortunate man found that he was anticipated even in the court of the Viceroy, and in that of the Governor of Ulster, the Earl of Charlemont, and then he cried out in a loud voice, The Italian primate, the Roman primate, has unhorsed me. The Earl of Charlemont has not molested even one ecclesiastic since my arrival here. He is also so friendly with me that on one occasion, seeing me somewhat afraid, he said to me, Have no fear, no one shall dare touch you. And when you want to administer confirmation, don't go any more to the mountains, but come to the courtyard of my palace. 
He made me a present during my life of a garden and excellent orchard with two fields and a fine house. It is in an excellent position. As to the viceroy, it is notorious that he has such an esteem for me as even to conciliate in my behalf the favour of the king. Dr. Brennan, who has my cipher, will tell more to your excellency. Suffice it to say that he granted me the lives of three Catholics who had been prosecuted and condemned in the city of Ennis Kellen. The Earl of Drogheda allows me to have a public church with bells, etc., in my diocese, within his district, which are exempt from the royal jurisdiction. No fewer than nine times have I been accused before the Viceroy on account of the schools and for exercising foreign jurisdiction. But life in the northern province was generally in a confused state. The combination of the plantation of Ulster, the civil war of 1641, and the ensuing invasion of Cromwell had left a majority of the native Irish in a desperate position. Dispossessed, or at best with reduced holdings, many of them formed into bands of Tories and preyed on the settlers. During this period also, the organisation of the Catholic Church had practically disappeared, and many of those who had joined religious orders or became secular priests had neither religious commitment nor even the benefit of formal education. So it is not surprising that the opposition to the reforms of Oliver Plunkett was somewhat extreme, as another letter of his shows. This Father Antony sought to take away my life here, instigating the Tories to kill me. They came at midnight about six years ago to the house of my vicar general, where I then was. They broke open the doors and took away all the money from myself and my vicar general and my secretary, Michael Plunkett, who is now in Rome, and they held a sword to my throat. The chief of this band was afterwards taken, and before death declared in prison to the parish priest of Armagh and to his curate that Father Antony told him to kill me, and that afterwards he would give him absolution. However, it is also worth noting that these dissidents represented only a small minority of the northern clergy. This letter sent to Rome in the first year of his episcopacy, in fact, was highly complimentary. When we send letters to Your Excellency, we consider ourselves addressing the Apostolic See. We have not written sooner to Your Excellency regarding our most illustrious primate, for we waited till his merits should be known to us by experience. And now that we have had this experience, we render exceeding thanks to the Apostolic See for having constituted over us such a pastor and teacher. Since his arrival in the province of Armagh, he is unceasing in his labours. To the great utility of the province, he convoked diocesan synods and instructed the clergy by word and by example, and in the ordinations which he held, he promoted none but such as were worthy, and only after they had passed a rigorous examination. Patrick Daly, Vicar General of Armagh, Patrick Mulderick, Vicar General Downing Connor, Ronan McGinn, Dean and Vicar General Dramore, Eugene Connell, Vicar General Derry and Rafoe, Thomas Fitzsimons, Archdeacon and Vicar General Kilmore, Patrick Cullen, Vicar General Clare. To the most illustrious Monsignor Baldeschi, etc., 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 Armagh, 8th of October, 1670. He was, however, on less surer ground in his political dealings, especially with the Viceroy. Following the official policy of the Church, and indeed his own instincts, Plunkett professed loyalty to the King and his Viceroy. Barclay, however, initially seemed to have been wary of him. He had all of Plunkett's letters to Rome intercepted. But when he saw that they contained complimentary remarks about himself, the Viceroy seems to have been genuinely flattered, and became friendly with Plunkett, and even allowed him to build schools in Drogheda, which were staffed by members of the Jesuit order, and were attended by both Protestants and Catholics. Barclay also sought his assistance in obtaining the surrender of some bands of Tories in the north, on condition that they would be transported to the continent a factor which did not increase Plunkett's popularity in certain areas, where he was now christened Oliver Cromwell. Also, his relationship with Peter Talbot, Archbishop of Dublin, now deteriorated. They had two completely different lifestyles. Talbot, a brilliant theologian also, but a veteran of 20 years' involvement in politics with Charles II, both in exile and at the court in London. 
on account of this friendship with the king and because of his efforts to regain land for the dispossessed in conjunction with his brother richard peter talbot had many enemies both in the person of ormond and not least in the house of commons in london talbot because of this political experience and his friendship with the king regarded himself as the principal bishop in ireland oliver plunkett however claimed the primacy for armagh and a dispute arose between them which was equally distressing to rome as it was to their fellow bishops john brennan bishop of warford was asked to intervene most illustrious and most reverend lord i have just received by way of london the letter of your excellency under date of the ninth of january in which you impose on me to use every diligence in appeasing the differences between the two archbishops but your excellency may believe me that this would be an extremely arduous undertaking as these dissensions are daily increasing and are now arrived to such a pitch that i do not know in what manner to quiet them since my arrival here i have not omitted to exhort them both to peace and for the most part i received good promises though occasionally i came in for a slight mortification they are both one and the other touchy and of a hot disposition and they are the first prelates of the kingdom and in my opinion they would be displeased to receive an admonition from an inferior bishop i would be desirous to live in peace without offending either of them especially as i could hope for but little fruit from my interference talbot also warned plunkett about the sincerity of one of his friends a colonel fitzpatrick who was a brother-in-law of ormond but plunkett rejected his advice and when the viceroy barclay was recalled to london he obviously changed sides on his return bishop brennan again the viceroy has now renounced the friendship of the archbishop of armagh and of john patrick and has been reconciled with the archbishop of dublin and his brother who will seek to procure for him a continuation in his office of viceroy and for this and other business colonel talbot has already taken his departure for london it is said that the archbishop of dublin will also go thither shortly but if he goes it will be on other business and perhaps he will go as far as innsbruck it seems that they both enjoy the favour of the court in london and also of the viceroy and they are for the most part very popular amongst the catholics of this kingdom on account of the interest displayed by the colonel in london in favour of the catholics in england relations between the king and parliament were also deteriorating charles had made his famous declaration of indulgence with regard to religious toleration and appointed shaftesbury as chancellor to push it through parliament but to no avail the war with the dutch which the parliament frowned upon was going badly there was talk about the increase in the numbers of catholics at court the duke of york had refused to take the anglican sacrament on the previous christmas and there were stories of protestants being persecuted in france far from granting religious toleration parliament brought in stricter religious laws in ireland another viceroy had been appointed lord essex in a letter written to the duke of ormond he outlined the current position with regard to religious matters soon after my coming hither as viceroy maloney the bishop of killaloo whom i look upon as the most dangerous because the wisest of all the clergy made a composure of religious differences between the archbishops of dublin and armagh i soon found that if this proceeded i should have no intelligence as to any of their practices and believing it to be one of the most important things i could do for his majesty's service and the security of his protestant subjects here either to keep these men divided or if they were united to break them again i have made use of some of their friars to set up factions against their bishops and by encouraging these animosities among themselves at length brought them to that pass that they openly accused one another of exercising ecclesiastical jurisdiction contrary to the law of the land by the address of the house of commons all the regular clergy are to be banished and should i put these exactly into execution i must send all these poor friars abroad who have done this service your most humble servant essex but in another letter written about the same time Essex gave specific instructions with regard to Oliver Plunkett and the new religious laws. 
My lord, since my late coming over here as Viceroy, I have heard many petitions made, but none so excessive as that of Her Grace, the Duchess of Cleveland, that she be given possession of the Phoenix Park here in Dublin. I scarce know any one thing that would make me more incapable to serve His Majesty as I ought than the consenting of this grant, and I am likewise sure Her Grace could have asked for nothing so unfit for the King to give. My Lord Ormond has written angrily about the affair, pointing to the scandal which would follow the granting away of this park. With regard to matters of religion, here is one Oliver Plunkett, who seems to be one of the best men of his persuasion I have met with, and though I doubt not that he is industrious enough in promoting his own religion, yet I could never find but he was a more peaceable temper and more conformable to the government than any of their titular bishops in this country. I know not well what proceedings may be in Parliament in relation to us here. This only, shall I say, that in case any debates should arise by way of discriminating of persons and putting banishments or other punishments upon particulars, I should be glad, for the reasons above mentioned, you should yourself, and some of your friends, secure this gentleman from any such severity which should be singly and personally inflicted upon him. Your Lordship's most assured servant, Essex. And indeed, when orders of banishment were made in the House of Commons concerning the clergy in Ireland, the advice of Essex was acted upon. We, Your Majesty's loyal subjects of the House of Commons, in this present Parliament assembled, taking into consideration the calamities which have befallen Your Majesty's subjects of the Kingdom of Ireland, from the Popish recusants there, who are at this time grown more insolent, do humbly present Your Majesty with these petitions that the titular popish archbishops, bishops, vicar-generals, and all others exercising ecclesiastical jurisdictions by the Pope's authority, and in particular Peter Talbot, pretended Archbishop of Dublin, for his notorious disloyalty to Your Majesty, may be commanded by proclamation forthwith to depart out of the kingdom. Peter Talbot, however, in typical fashion, made his way to the court in London, and from there he went to Paris. Plunkett, unaware of the action of Essex concerning him, went into hiding with the Bishop of Waterford. Following the edict of the Viceroy, the registered clergy should be treated with the greatest rigour. I and my companion, Dr. Brennan, Bishop of Waterford, deemed it necessary to take to our heels. The snow fell heavily, mixed with hailstones, and blew so dreadfully in our eyes that to the present we have scarcely been able to see with them. Often we were in danger in the valleys of being lost and suffocated in the snow, until at length we arrived at the house of a reduced gentleman who had nothing to lose. But for our misfortune he had a stranger in the house by whom we did not wish to be recognised. Hence we were placed in a large garret without a chimney and without fire, where we have been for the past eight days. May it redound to the glory of God, the salvation of our souls, and the flocks entrusted to our charge. So dreadful was the hail and cold that the running of the eyes of my companion and myself has not yet ceased, and I feel that I shall lose more than one tooth, so frightful is the pain they give me. Blessed be God who granted us the favour of suffering not only for the chair of Peter, but on the very day dedicated to the feast of that chair, which, resting on a rock, will, as I hope, in the end, break the violence of these tempestuous waves. While he was in hiding, however, his schools in Drogheda were closed down, never to reopen. But as the year passed, the new laws were relaxed, and Oliver Plunkett renewed his pastoral work, visiting dioceses in the west and the south of the country, in addition to the north. In England, Shaftesbury, having got an inkling of the secret terms of the Treaty of Dover, turned against the king, and championed the cause of Monmouth, the illegitimate son of Charles, in an effort to have him declared heir to the throne, to the exclusion of James. In Parliament, Shaftesbury led the country party, and a direct confrontation between Parliament and the King loomed. In Ireland, Oliver Plunkett's difficulties still stemmed from the dissident clergy in his province. He had settled a dispute between the Dominicans and Franciscans over the possession of monasteries in favour of the Dominicans, thereby alienating some members of the Franciscan order. 
Also, in the Diocese of Clogher, the appointment of Dr. Tyrrell, again a palesman from County Meath, was resisted. He also suspended several other clerics, and spiteful letters were constantly being written to Rome about him. It was now 1678, and the incongruous figure of Titus Oates was appearing before the Privy Council in London. He claimed that the Jesuits in England, in union with the Pope and the French, were on the point of murdering the King, and overthrowing the Kingdom. The mysterious death of a magistrate to whom Oates had first given his evidence gave credence to his story. The Popish plot was born, and Shaftesbury, a superb propagandist, made use of it to embarrass the King and the Duke of York. Jesuits were arrested, tried and hastily executed. Pope-burning processions were organised in London to stir up the fears of the populace. The word of Titus Oates became law. People locked their doors, fearing for their families at the hands of the dreaded Jesuits. And while passions were inflamed in London, there was a growing apprehension too in Ireland, as Plunkett reported. Here matters go from bad to worse. A proclamation offers £10 to whosoever arrests a bishop or Jesuit, and £5 to whosoever arrests a vicar-general or friar. The police, spies and soldiers are in pursuit day and night. Colonel Fitzpatrick, an excellent Catholic, although a relative of the Duke of Ormond, was exiled by order of Parliament, which is desirous of prosecuting even the Duke of York on account of his being a Catholic. I am morally certain that I shall be taken, so many are in search of me. Yet, in spite of danger, I will remain with my flock, nor will I abandon them till they drag me to the ship. But in case that I should be taken, I must request you to let me know whether I shall go, for I am sure they will allow me this choice as they have allowed it to others. I pray you to let me know your advice and counsel on this head, whether to go to Flanders, or to France, or to some other place. But no attempt was made to arrest him, at least not yet. Titus Oates had named Peter Talbot as the Lord Chancellor of the Rebels in Ireland. Talbot had in fact returned to Ireland, but was now in very bad health. He was named because of the fact that while he was in France, he had exposed errors in the writings of an English cleric named Sargent, who had a hatred of the Jesuits, and who, although remaining in the background, played a large part in the framing of the plot. The Duke of Ormond had been restored as Viceroy to keep Ireland for the King, and on orders received from the Parliament in England had Talbot arrested. However, he was not brought to trial because the organisers of the plot were afraid he could expose them. Ormond himself now came under pressure because of his steadfast loyalty to the king. It was suddenly remembered that most of his relations were Catholic. Few that have any brains that know me, or have but a superficial account of my life, will give credit to the report that I have been seen to take the sacrament the Romish way at my sister's Clancartes. Above all, let Mr. Oates, his first deposition, be examined and it will clearly appear that it was designed by the conspirators that I should be killed. But finally, in December of 1679, Ormond did order the arrest of Plunkett. But ironically, it was not on the orders of Parliament, or indeed in connection with the Popish plot. The order for Plunkett's arrest came from the King. On information received from the Chief Secretary, I ordered the arrest of the titular Bishop Plunkett and Bishop Tyrrell. Plunkett hath been taken, and Tyrrell is still being sought after. I have forborne to have Plunkett examined until His Majesty's pleasure concerning him to be known. It is a curious affair. Colonel Fitzpatrick, having had to go to the Continent, on his arrival at Brussels, did present to the Internuncio a letter subscribed by four bishops, including both Plunkett and Tyrrell, recommending that he be the only person fit enough to be entrusted with the head of an army for establishing the Popish religion in Ireland with the help of the French. This letter did come into the hands of the Duke of York, who is presently in that city, and he did send it to the court, who have ordered these arrests. I cannot understand this action of Fitzpatrick, or what his motives are, but I have little doubt that the contents of the letter be false, nor is there the smallest sign here of a rising or reports of a French invasion. However, 
In my report concerning Fitzpatrick, owing to family ties, I shall have to support his former deeds, making no reference to this latest scandal. It was indeed a curious affair, and begged many questions. Was Fitzpatrick's action prompted by some of Plunkett's dissident clergy, who in fact gave the letter to the Duke of York, who obviously believed that there was some truth in it, as did the King? In his letter, even Ormond dismissed Fitzpatrick's letter as being without foundation. But there is no doubt that Fitzpatrick, the former confidant of Plunkett, put him in a very precarious position. The mention of a French invasion fitted in with the descriptions of the Popish plot. From that moment, Plunkett's life was in danger. It was exactly the proof which Shaftesbury needed, namely that the Catholics in Ireland were planning to bring in the French. But he needed witnesses. There was no lack of people in Ireland to give evidence against Oliver Plunkett, and names like William Hetherington, Edmund Murphy and John McMoyer came into prominence for the first time. They crossed over and back to London, but pressure to have the trial moved to London was initially filed by Ormond. The discoveries, now on foot in the north and west of this kingdom, can come to nothing, by reason of the extravagant villainy and folly of the discoverers, who are such creatures that no schoolboy would trust them with a design for the robbing of an orchard. Murphy is all but debauched, and Hetherington, the other fellow brought by my lord Shaftesbury to the council, broke prison, being in execution. Nor can less be said of MacMoyer. If rogues they must be that you discover roguery, these must be the best discoverers, because they are the greatest rogues. With regard to the trial of Plunkett, notwithstanding the efforts of several to have the trial moved, it shall be held in Dundalk, the scene of the reputed treasonable crimes. Plunkett had over thirty witnesses at Dundalk ready to testify in his favour, but when the witnesses for the Crown, including Murphy, failed to appear, the trial was abandoned, and in October 1680 the trial was moved to London. I was brought from Ireland to the City of London last October, and subjected to the sufferings of a rigorous imprisonment, so that no human being, save the guard of my prison, had access to me. But now permission has been granted to me to write. About a fortnight ago, I was accused for seeking to introduce the holy Catholic and apostolic faith, and to overrun and destroy the Protestant religion. But the trial is deferred that I might bring my witnesses from Ireland. I shall have a severe trial, for neither the jury nor the judges are acquainted with my circumstances and those of my accusers. In the meantime, the parliaments of 1679 and 1680 had introduced bills to exclude the Duke of York from succeeding Charles. The 1680 bill was thrown out by the Lords, and the Commons, in revenge, refused to grant any supplies of money to the King. Charles prorogued Parliament and summoned another to meet at Oxford in March of the following year. It was now that Shaftesbury and his party became interested also in the case of Edward Fitzharris, who had been lately accused of trying to blackmail the court. Shaftesbury's followers now marched down to Oxford shouting slogans of No Popery, No Slavery. The two main issues were again the Exclusion Bill and also the release of Fitzharris from the Tower of London where the King had kept him to ensure that he would stand trial. The Commons intended to impeach Fitzharris in Parliament and thereby to get him to accuse both the Duke of York and the Queen. The House of Lords finally refused to accept the impeachment, and, to the consternation of the Commons, the King again prorogued Parliament at the end of March. Five weeks later, on May the 3rd, Oliver Plunkett appeared in the dock at Westminster Hall. The charge was treason, and he was described as being a false traitor, the fear of God in his heart not having, but seduced by the instigation of the devil, intending with all his might to stir up war and rebellion, and also to cause the death of the King and the true worship of God to alter to the superstition of the Romish Church. At his own request he was granted five weeks' delay to send to Ireland for his witnesses. It is more likely, however, that this time was given to him only to avoid a clash with the trial of Fitzharris which began on the following day and involved most of the same judges. So his trial proper began on June the 8th. By this time Fitzharris had been found guilty but not sentenced. None of his witnesses had arrived in time, 
In fact, most of them were afraid to come, and so his trial began. I humbly beg your lordship's favour. The case is rare. I am come here where no jury knows me, nor the quality of my adversaries. If I had been in Ireland, I would have put myself upon my trial tomorrow without any witnesses that knew them and me. There was no prosecution of you there. But, my lord, there is no jury here that know me or the quality of my adversaries. But they are not a jury of the neighbourhood that know them. And therefore, my case is not the same with other cases. Though I cannot, nor do not, nor will not, nor ought not, the least conceit of hard measure and injustice get, if I have not full time to bring my records and witnesses all together, I cannot make my defence. I beseech your lordship that I may have time to bring my records and witnesses, and then I will defy all that is upon the earth and under the earth to say anything against me. Uh, look here, Mr. Plunkett. It is in vain for you to talk and make this discourse here now. It is rare that any man has had such time as you have had, five weeks' time, to provide your witnesses. If your witnesses are such persons that they dare not come into England without such and such cautions, we cannot tell how to help it. We can't furnish you with witnesses. You must look to get your witnesses yourself. If we should stay till your witnesses come, so you will escape out of the hands of justice. You came here to be tried. Look to the jury and accept against them if you will. My lord, I desire only to have the favour of some time. I humbly present this to your lordship. I am then in imminent danger of my life if I cannot get ten days to have my witnesses over. I desire I may have but to the 21st of this month, and then if this do not come, you may go on. We cannot do it. You have had five weeks' time already. My lord, I desire to know whether they have been the jury of Langhorn or the five Jesuits, or any that were condemned. That is no exception. The proceedings of the trial itself were remarkable only for the succession of Irish witnesses who fabricated a tale of Plunkett's involvement with the French invasion in Carlingford Lock. They included ex-priests, ex-friars and laymen, their motives ranging from greed to avarice to hatred. In courts of law at the time, the onus was on the prisoner to prove himself innocent. Plunkett, who, according to the law, in case of treason, had to defend himself, did so ably, but he was confronted by a formidable array of judges, including the Lord Chief Justice, the Attorney General, the Solicitor General, and Sergeant Jeffreys, later in history to be known as the Hanging Judge. The only minor sensation during the trial was the manner in which one of the principal witnesses, ex-priest and Tory Edmund Murphy, suffering from some remorse of conscience, tried to hedge his evidence. Call Edmund Murphy. Tell your whole knowledge of Dr Plunkett and the Irish plot. May it please you, my lord, I was one of the first discoverers of this plot. Uh, but of nine witnesses, I have but one in town. Well, tell your own knowledge. Now, I beg your lordship, as to Dr. Plunkett, that you will respite till next term. I could bring ten witnesses. Do you speak your own evidence? I refer it to the king and council, what evidence I have given. Do not trouble yourself. Be directed a little. You are here now to speak what you know concerning any treasons or any other matters against the King done by Dr. Plunkett. Speak your own knowledge, for as to other witnesses we do not call you. If I be called in question for this evidence... Oh, come, sir. You have been at the Spanish ambassadors lately. Answer my question. Have you ever been with Plunkett in Ireland? Yes, sir. Have you ever heard him own himself primate of Ireland? Yes, titular primate. Under whom did he claim that authority? Under the king or under the pope? I think he could not be under the king at all. Under whom then? It must be either the king or the pope. Answer me directly. Did he claim to be titular primate under the pope? I suppose he did. Was he reputed generally so to be? Yes, my lord. Mr Murphy, remember what you swore before the grand jury. Pray recollect yourself whether that be true, and tell all. You are upon your oath. You must speak the truth and the whole truth. You must not mince or conceal anything. Were you sworn before the grand jury? 
I was sworn before the king and parliament. Did you give in any evidence to the grand jury? Yes, I did. Was that you swore before the jury true, upon your oath? I, I can't say what it was. Repeat it. Tell my lord and the jury what it was and tell the truth. I, I, I have forgot it. Why, then I would ask you a little. You remember I was by. And it is no laughing matter, Mr. Murphy. You will find it so. What do you know of any orders issued out by Mr. Plunkett to raise money from the priests? Well, I know there were orders, uh, and I took the orders myself in my hand. From whom had you those orders? Uh, from another, and uh, not from him. Under whose hand were those orders? They were from the primate. Did you see any order under Plunkett's hand for raising of money? No, but under the vicar general's, by his authority, as I supposed. Upon your oath, did you not swear before the grand jury that you saw the orders under his hand? No, I did not, or I was mistaken, for it was only by his direction. Did you have any converse with Oliver Plunkett about the raising of money? Oliver Plunkett and the raising of money? Yes, that is a plain question. It was about other matters I conversed with him. But did you converse with him about bringing in the French? Declare the truth, come. Come, don't trifle. What discourse had you with the prisoner about raising of money or bringing in the French? Either of them, sir? I knew this. If the Duke of York and the Duke of Monmouth had proceeded according to their intentions, it was a general expectation at the same time that, that all the French and Irish would fall upon the English nation, as I understood. Pray answer the question directly. You must not come and think to trifle with the court. You must speak the truth. You are sworn to it. You must not come to quibble and run about to this and that and the other. But answer Despite this, there was no delay in reaching a verdict. Oliver Plunkett was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging, drawing and quartering. On the same day, Fitzharris received the same sentence. There was a fortnight's delay between the passing of sentence and the date of execution. During this time, several attempts were made to gain a reprieve. Approaches were made to the king by many, including the Spanish ambassador and the late Viceroy Essex, to whom the king is reported to have asked why he had not spoken on his behalf at the trial. Plunkett himself also petitioned the king by letter, but with the execution of Fitzharris on the same day there was to be no reprieve, and so 